All right, we're now joined by Marty Biron, and and I don't even know how to introduce you officially because you've got about 10 different jobs. I mean, one of them is being an analyst with TSN. You're a co-host of Sabres Live. You still doing the MSG stuff? Like you seem to be all over. Well, the place. I do the MSG stuff, but that's through the Buffalo Sabres, right? So I don't. Oh, I've yeah. gone to yeah. MSG New York a couple of times. I, I'm technically the lifetime. This is maybe the title, Henrik Lundqvist lifetime backup. Because when Lundqvist <laughs> left to go do TNT and they needed somebody in the playoffs last year, they called me. They're like, Marty, come and fill Lundqvist's seat at the table. So I'm <laughs> Henrik Lundqvist's lifetime backup. That's what you can say. I, I loved when uh, Hank made his his debut on on the MSG panel, and they panned the camera wide, and Steve Valakett had a towel around his neck. <laughs> That's so That's bad. Right. Lifetime back. There's a club. There's a club of us. There's the Lundquist Lifetime Backup, and, and Valley's definitely a member of that too. <laughs> Henrik is smooth though, isn't he? Uh, like, I mean, for a guy who hasn't done much TV other than being the focus of countless interviews yeah. over the years, man, he sits on that panel and, you know, there's a comfort, right? You have to have a comfort. You can't worry about the camera, but that's easier said than done until you've done it 500 times. But in Hank's case, Marty, man, he's just a natural. I don't know what's going on with the Swedes, but they can speak English better than the uh, <laughs> people in North America. Like there's Gabe Landis Goggin. Like yourself? And, yeah, with myself. Like, you know, like, okay, so, you know, I'm like looking to see, maybe I should do some national stuff in the U.S. too. Add one more thing to my, and they're like, you don't sound very American. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, I'll stick to Canada in that way. That's good for me. <laughs> so, so Marty, I, I mentioned in the in our intro about uh, you and Luke Robitaille. Both of you have been in the states for forty yeah. years, and and you both speak the same. What it, like are you trying to do that? Like, what exactly is that that you and Luke pull okay, off? Right, I'll tell you. This is a kind of an embarrassing but funny story. So about. Eh, seven, eight years ago, I got a call from this guy and he goes, Marty, they're looking for a French Canadian goalie to do this commercial. It's a national commercial. It's for like uh, car parts or whatever. And this guy's going to be dressed in a goalie and going to make saves in the store with all this thing. They want to do an audition with you and uh, you just got to be yourself, right? And they want a French Canadian goalie. So I'm like, sure. They came to Buffalo set up this whole room with cameras or whatever. I had a script. I delivered my lines. I thought I did a damn good job. And then they're like, didn't sound French enough. I'm like, well, it, like, what, oh what can it be? Either I sound too French or I don't sound French enough. Like, I don't know. So it's not an act. It's just the way that it is. <laughs> that's, that's unbelievable. <laughs> because when, when I played with Lou, I was like, oh my gosh, he's been in the States yeah. at that time, you know, 25 yeah. years. And it's like, some guys, it goes, like the Swedes you yeah. mentioned, it just goes away, their accent. Yeah. I, I don't know how it is. It just Luke is a little bit worse, though. I, I'll tell you, Luke, um, from the time I was a kid and I used to watch him at the All-Star Game or whatever, I thought he was always a funny, great guy. And then he's like a different person in English. I'm like, wait a second, like there's two Luke. There's Lucky Luke, and then there's Luke Robitaille, like the French guy, right? And it was <laughs> he's so funny. I've got some stories, and I need confirmation on one of them. And, and Ray, maybe you got to call him or Dregs. And there's a story of Luke Robitaille wanted to impress this girl on a date when he first started in the NHL. And he, uh, he went to a restaurant, and he asked for steak tartare. Well done. So... <laughs> <laughs> but, so that's so Luke, right? Like to like not know that well, tartar is usually raw, like kind of mixed in together. You can have it's that so well good. done. <laughs> hey, you know, you we talked a little bit. Of, we somehow got in from Henrik Lundqvist to this. <laughs> um, so just back to Henrik for a second. Um, I think he does an amazing job. Like he's got a way of explaining things that. The technical things a goalie does, yeah, yeah. and it makes it seem understandable. Yeah. I, I, did you always know the goalie position was as technical as it is now? Like, I mean, of course, you were an NHL goalie. You were a terrific goalie. We just used to look at it like, I don't know, they do what they yeah. do and they stop the puck. Of course, we knew it was more technical than that. But I had no idea over the last five, ten years 
how technical the position has become. I'll say this. I was probably maybe 18 or 19 years old when I first realized, oh, if I'm going to play at the next level, I better start working on the technical part of it. And that's when there was maybe a shift, right? So Francois and Benoit Lair had their goalie school in Montreal. And that was when Patrick Wall won the cup in 93. And it was like the butterfly style. Like, what is the butterfly style? Why would goalies go on their knees to make saves? And then it developed. Yeah. And I had to kind of go to their goalie school and learn it. Because for me, it was two pad stack, poke check, come out to challenge. And I had a, a friend of the family that was a, um, a semi-pro, semi-professional goaltender back in his days. And he was basically my goalie coach, right, in my Bantam years and whatnot. And we would do up and down. So like it was literally like go 50 mm. times on your knees and up. And that was conditioning. And and then I, I went to Frank and, and Benny Allaire's goalie school. And Francois Allaire was working for my agent at the time too. So he took me to Switzerland, to Verbier, up in the mountains for a summer goalie wow. school for two weeks. And I was his apprentice. I was dressed in my gear. And whenever we would say, okay, we're going to do a drill where you push from the post to here, to here, you go butterfly, you push over. I was the guy that demoed it and then went out and did the drill. I, I kid you not, that two weeks probably changed my life, right? Because I came wow. back and I was like, oh my gosh, I did not realize how hard it is to actually play goalie. Because for me, it was just like getting away of the puck and play street hockey goalie. Right. And I remember coming back from Switzerland and that was the year before I turned pro. And then I went to Rochester and had a tough start to the season in Rochester because I was trying to implement all these things. And then about eh, February, it started taking off. And then the next year it took off. And then I was like, oh, okay. Like there's a technical aspect to the game that I needed to learn and I sure. needed to be better at. But it took me a long time before I found uh, found out about it, especially like growing up through juniors. I was, you know, still a, a pretty good goalie, but then I got to be a better goalie that way. So does the DNA travel through the generation here? How's your son? He's doing, doing really good. Uh, you know, playing junior A hockey up in Canada and he's loving it and he's a lot better than I was. But everybody, like the generations after us and Ray yeah. gets it and Drake's same, like it's like they're way better than we were. They can do things that we could never do, right? And it's it's fun to see. Um, he's a big pain in the neck though. I, I like I was always the nice, <laughs> calm person. I got my fair share of blockers in the back of the head and slash here and kind of, he wants to get in more fights than me. Like I got in one with Ray Emery, <laughs> but he wants to get in like five of them or whatnot. And I keep telling him, stay oh, in your boy. bubble. I think he's learning now because that's the yeah, other day he was right. watching a, a Vegas game. And he sent me a, a text, Aiden Hill getting out of his, and then there was an emoji bubbles. And I'm like, you're learning. Like he needs to dial it back. Right. Yeah. I'm like, that's good. So that's hopefully awesome. it's, He's learning a little bit. <laughs> okay, so you bring up Aiden Hill. We're in the finals. We're seeing two goalies at either ends of maybe their yep. careers. In you know, I mean, Bob has been a Bobrovsky's been a a Vezina Trophy winner, and you know, and he's been in the net and out of the net, and and then you've got Aiden Hill, who really is you know just kind of out of nowhere dropped into prominence here into the finals. When you look at those two goalies, why are each of them as playing as well as they are at this time. Well, they're both different goaltenders and they are playing yeah. well to their identity. Like uh, Bobrovsky is a athletic, fast, laterally, explosive type of goaltender. I mean, in game three, you could see that he had his game back together. He's moving across laterally, getting the blocker out. Like he, he is... Uh, Marty, does the extra day off help him? Well, that's the, 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 the common sense here is, especially with a goalie like Bobrovsky, is that... He needs mm -hmm. a little bit more time. But I like to think that when he gets into a rhythm, like he doesn't need that time. And we saw that in the first couple mm -hmm. of rounds. Yeah, he, he had five days yeah. between Toronto and Carolina. But he's, when he's in a rhythm, the guy's unreal. He rides the bike for 45 minutes after games just so that he can play longer, that he can be fresher, right? His body is trained that way. Um, so I think that the extra day off, may have not helped him in the sense of energy, maybe just to calm down. Like he had 10 days between games. Then he played two games. He was okay. Game two wasn't great, but I'm not going to pin it on him. And then it was more for mental reset, more than a physical reset. I think that it helped him. But, but Sergey is, you know, incredibly athletic, agile, flexible, 
you know, the legs come out and, and it's fun to see. Aiden Hill is a, a puck blocker. He's huge. He's six foot six, 230 pounds. He lets the puck hit him, right? He's structured positioning. He's deep. I think that's one thing that Sean Burke really has helped Aiden Hill kind of understand mm. is you can play deeper. You don't have to chase the game. That's, again, Benny Allaire influence. When Benny Allaire was the goalie coach in Phoenix and Sean Burke was there, he's like, hey, Berkey, let's pull you back in a little bit. You're huge. Like, you don't have to get caught out in that. And and I think Berkey's done that with Mike Smith. He's done that with other goaltenders. And it's worked. So, uh, but Hill is a puck blocker. What we saw in game three is that if he's, if the shots are, are really good, like post and, you know, if you can put him in good location, you have time to pick a spot. It's not going to be as good for Aiden Hill. So uh, two different goaltenders, both very effective in what they do. But, uh, you know, they're totally different styles of goaltender. Explain this uh, comment to me. Um, I had somebody tell me about Bobrovsky, uh, somebody that likes him a lot as a goaltender and has been around him a lot, is he gets into trouble when he tries to stop more than one shot at a time. Like he, so what, what I mean, there's only one puck. Yeah. So, like, what is that exactly? I, how, how can you try to so do that? So, I think what that also means is that he gets in trouble when he's not square, right? So, often you cheat, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to turn myself because I'm going to play two, three options at the same time. If the puck hits me, it's going to go to a different place. Like, you're trying to think ahead of the game. And I think with Bobrovsky, when he's square, and that's the key for all goalies, um, mm-hmm. you know, they're really good. But think of inconsistencies in Bobrovsky's game, bad goals, pucks that mm. leak through him, pucks that beat him short side. That's when he gets turned around. Um, a goal that is a very good example of that is Willie Nylander in the second round comes down the right side as a right shot and, and he yeah. beats him short side. Like Bobrovsky was turning sideways, playing maybe a different option and then Nylander puts it up top and you're thinking that that's not a great goal to give up. Well, he was overthinking it, trying to play at uh, you know a couple shots at the same time or a couple options at the same time. But when he's square, whew, he's uh, he's really hard to beat. Now, yes, he gets slow to the ice, but who doesn't, right? Every goalie, Vasilevsky gets slow to the ice, Shosturkin gets slow to the ice. Now these guys are a little bigger than Bob, but um, that I think that would be the the way to explain he's playing multiple shots, it's just multiple options okay. at times yeah, yeah. gets him sideways. Marty, it's going to be a busy off season. I mean, that's already started. You know, we saw a three-way trade earlier yeah. this week involving a goaltender, Cal Peterson. Um, you know, if I look at the teams in need of goaltending, I mean, where does it start? It doesn't really matter. Ottawa, of course, uh, maybe LA, maybe LA. Uh, and then Buffalo is rumored to be interested in a, in a goalie ad, although top four defense seems to be more of a priority there. You know, we can talk about Connor Hellebuck and what may or may not go down uh, in Winnipeg, Ray and I already talked about that in in headlines. Um, but aside from the obvious of a Connor Hellebuck and the level of improvement he would bring, is is there another guy out there? Like, is there let somebody me get that my we're list. not? I got I got a book. yeah let that we're not talking about. Go oh, he's got that. the red book. Oh, it's and it's the red book, so you know it's it important. It is important. Oh. It's red. I got multiple colors for different things. I've got this book here, and I wrote down <laughs> UFA goalies, RFA goalies, and trade goalies, right? And obviously, your okay. UFA goalies are the ones you know are a little older, and maybe it hasn't worked as well as they wanted in certain area. Um, I've always been a pretty good fan, big fan, and maybe pushing it a little bit of Tristan Jari. And the, the health with Jari, but I'm intrigued to see where Jari ends up, right, just because of that. Mm. and. And I think there's a bit of a reclamation project with Jari and that he's had success and, but it's kind of always like kind of plunged down to yeah. nothing after a while. And, and there's a team that's going to say, hey, come on in. We like you, we want you. And, and that's going to be good. So, but for me, the, the, there's two guys that I think are, they're, they're vulnerable. There's a couple of teams that are vulnerable right now for uh, a couple of goalies and their offer sheet goalies, Jeremy Swayman and Ooh. Philip Gustafson. Because Swayman and Boston mm-hmm. and their cap situation and the fact that they have Allmark there, can a team come in and offer, you know, $6 million a year on a one-year deal maybe for Swayman and give up a first and a third? Like, is a first and a third too much to give up for Jeremy Swayman? 
Like really, he's a, no, he's no. a number one goaltender. No. I, I think it's 6.4 million. Anything under 6.4 million is like a first and a third. So if you want to push it to the limit, give him more than Lena Solmark and make that Boston make a decision mm. there. Mar- Marty, that's uh, just to jump in for a second. So that also puts time pressure on Don Sweeney and the oh, Bruins yeah. Yeah. because they can't let that get to July 1st. And what's today? The 9th yeah. of June. All of a sudden, the, the wheels start spinning faster. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. They, they, or maybe you have to work out a trade at the, at the, at the draft, right? And say, well, we got to do something yeah. because we're, we're sitting ducks here. And, and Minnesota is the same thing. I think Gustafson's a great goaltender, and he proved that. Um, a little bit surprising in his upbringing with Ottawa, and then he gets to Minnesota. But uh, Minnesota's in cap hell for the next few years because of their, you know, Parisian suitors, yeah. uh, you know, buyouts. So could you come in? They have Mark Andre Fleury. Like, can you come in? And those two goaltenders for me would be two prime targets Ooh. that I would look at July one and say, okay, let's make something happen. But, but that's me. I love the 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 the, the crazy stuff. So we can talk about it. So, Marty, in Buffalo, one of the things that Kevin Adams and Don Granato um, have have really stayed to, and I guess it's more in particular an organizational view from Kevin Adams, is they're not going to go get someone to block one of their younger players and their pathway. And I think it's a really cool idea to have. Now, Buffalo, were, were they one point out of the playoffs? Yeah, technically by, two by the because of, they needed uh, to get ahead of Philly, uh, Florida right. with a tiebreaker. But yeah, one point. Okay, so they they used you know they used a bunch of goalies last year, and they got good play from this guy, good play from that. However, they all pieced it together. Now they've got Devin Levi. Two questions. Everyone points to UC Soros and says Devin Levi because they're the same size. Is Devin Levi a possibility to be UC Soros? And what do they do in the off season as far as bringing in a partner? Well, they they themselves? may have a partner already, right? If you if you think Levi is ready for the NHL, then is he? It's hard. Look, coming in and playing seven yeah. games at the end of the season is completely different yeah. than being the guy that has to play fifty five games in a year, right? You're coming right. from college, right? You, like you don't play well. Although Levi played every game for. You know, the, his whole time at Northeastern, like there was, there was only one goalie on the roster, uh, basically. But uh, yeah, he just played every. But to do it for a whole season, the NHL, that's different. I think they're gonna give him the chance, and I think they want him to run with it. Uh, but that's still a question mark. So I think for that reason, they don't want to do too many things to bl- either block him or to make it even more crowded because they have Eric Comrie and they have Ukopeka Lukanen and then you end up with another three goalie circus, which is not good, right? So for me personally, I think Levi is their guy. Why? Because mm-hmm. Levi embraces chaos. He's, he's that UC Soros type of guy. He's athletic, he's flexible, uh, great. Like the fastest mm-hmm. leg I think I've seen on a young goaltender moving in from juniors mm-hmm. or college to the pros. Like he's got beautiful, like Mitch, yeah. Mitch Korn used to say that all the time. Who are Jim Corsi? You've got beautiful legs. Like I love it. Thanks for the compliment. But he's got beautiful legs, so I think he would fit perfectly. Now, what Don Granado has done as a coach in Buffalo has been let's build the identity that we can score goal because that's really hard to do, and then we're gonna work backwards and kind of tweak the defensive side of the game. Um, so maybe it looks different next year, right? Because they've already built that identity yeah. that Thompson and Tuck, and Skinner, and Cousins, and Quinn, and Paterka, and even Middlestat to that extent, like, they can provide offense. Maybe now it's the work that needs to be done on creating that defensive identity. So maybe you don't need a goalie that embraces chaos as much as Levi does, but I still think that that's their best option. He's their best goalie right now. Do you want to trust the college goalie to come in and take you to the promised land? I mean, mm. that's, the, that's the question Kevin Adams has to ask himself right now. I... I'd say yes, because I like to play craps at the casino and roll the dice. But, uh, you know, crapping <laughs> yeah. out on your first hand is never good. No, nah. <laughs> never good. No. Nah. Well, as we said, we know they're in the market for a top yeah. 4D. Marty, you've got a busy day ahead, so we're going to we're gonna cut you loose. Are you? By the way, are you in studio at TSN for July 1st? I am or no? coming in for free agent home? frenzy, yes. Okay. So you are going to bring the Red Book. And I get to see all of the different colors and all of the different homework that you've yeah. done in, in compiling yeah, this. See, thing. I got, uh, 
You know what? I have a great little, <laughs> I got to find it, but you guys talk about goaltenders and the question that I've been asked a lot lately, and we'll wrap it up with that because I do have to go, um, is do you need a top tier goaltender to win a Stanley Cup? Because people are saying you got Aiden Hill, right? And, and Anthony yeah. Niemi won a cup and you had Michael Layton, Brian Boucher on the other side and whatnot. The last five Stanley Cup finals, only three of the 10 starting goalies finished above 20th, worse than 20th in goal save expectation in the, in the regular season. So everybody that's made it to the Stanley Cup, seven out of 10 goalies that made it to the Stanley Cup finals were top 20 in the league. Over 100 goaltenders most year, they were top 20. It's not so much about the money, it's about the performance, and you do need a top goaltender. So there, there you go. go. All right, Marty. Thanks for joining okay, us, buddy. Okay, thanks, guys. Marty, thanks, okay. buddy. It was See awesome. You